go straight across onto our spotlight for this evening. Global risks are rising and rising fast as a referendum over whether Britain should stay in the EU or not looms. Other than that, investors around the world are keenly watching the major central banks, especially the U.S. Federal Reserve. The central bank begins its two-day policy meeting tomorrow as markets and banks remain curious about a possibility of an interest rate hike. Those factors combined with the Trump uh, issue in the US politics and geopolitics in the Middle East have all made for a cocktail of jitters. To discuss all that, I am now joined by Luigi Zingales, Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. He's also co-author of Saving Capitalism from the Capitalists with the RBI Governor Raghuram Rajan. Thank you so very much, Professor, for joining us here on the big picture. The global economy is seriously on the tenterhooks. It opened with the markets in Nikkei, you know, crashing down, and the impact was felt all over the globe. Is this kind of pessimism in global markets justified, Professor? I think it is a bit excessive. I think that uh, even if uh, the UK were to decide to leave the EU, it will not be the end of the world. Uh, I think that uh, the Europeans export uh, many more goods to England than the other way around, so I don't think they're going to retaliate massively. And uh, they're still part of the WTO, so the, the tariffs would not be that big. Uh, I think that actually might provide an opportunity to rethink the European Union that needs a lot of rethinking. All right. So, Professor, because, you know, that's interesting what you're saying, because we've had analysts on this channel who are saying that the implication of Bre you know, you know, Brexit are, are rather scary. In fact, the effects of that will not only be restricted within the European Union, but will also have spillover effects around the world. And, and these voices of concern are coming up, Professor, largely because now, you know, there are these sort of, uh, you know, exit polls numbers that are coming out where it seems that the Leaf campaign, the voices are growing very, very loud. So in that sense, you're saying that we should not overreact even if Brexit were to become a reality tomorrow? Uh, I think so. And it says, uh, can I uh, sort of make a scenario in which Brexit uh, is going to bring a lot of uh, disaster? Yes. But to some extent, these things are uh, self-fulfilling. The more we're going to say that the world will end if uh, uh, the UK were to leave the, the European Union, uh, the more this is likely to be the case. I don't think that that would be the end of the world. And I think it's better not to start thinking in that term. I think that... Uh, there are a lot of things that we can do to soften the blow, um, and uh, I think will not be the end of the world. Indeed, Professor. You know, closely associated with this issue of Brexit has been, of course, this entire narrative on, on anti-immigration, growing concerns of, of growing number of people entering countries, and this paranoia that they're taking away middle-class jobs. Tell us, in very simple terms, the long-term implication for economic growth owing to this anti-immigration narrative that is becoming increasingly ubiquitous across the continent of Europe? First of all, I want to make it clear two facts. The first is that uh, the middle class is losing out, but it's not losing out for immigrants. That, in the United States, for example, that represents just 10 percent of the problem. The vast majority of the losing out is due to new technology that makes a lot of uh, middle class jobs disappear, and uh, that erodes the uh, the income of the middle class. Uh, one fact that is pretty stunning is that if you look at the uh, real uh, wage of the median American male worker, this has been stable over the last 30 years. So these guys have not benefited from uh, the growth of the overall economy. And I think that uh, it's inevitable that this uh, disappointment manifests itself politically and manifests in different ways. In, in, uh, in the UK, manifest as uh, Brexit. In uh, the United States, manifest as uh, uh, a support for Trump. And in much of uh, the European Union, manifest in uh, actually more, even more right-wing boomers. If you think about uh, the success of uh, Le Pen in France or the quasi-success of uh, offer in Austria, those are all signs that uh, the middle class is not happy of the economic situation. So in that sense, would you say that capitalism is now facing its biggest threat? Not just capitalism, even, even if you look at globalization and the kind of narrative that's coming out, as you mentioned, even from Donald Trump. Do you think in that sense, globalization in the way in which we understood, let's say, 10 years back is under pressure because... Uh, you know, and what is even more worrying, Professor, is that global trade is also uh, also in a, in, a, in a state of slump. 
Putting it all together, do you think capitalism is facing one of its biggest crises in the recent history? I think that uh, globalization is losing consensus uh, around the world. And, uh, and I said uh, most of it for the wrong reason. I think that uh, what is eroding the uh, wages and the jobs of the middle class is mostly not globalization, is the progress of technology. But if you are an American, it's much easier to run a campaign against uh, uh, Chinese than it is to run a campaign against technology. Because, uh, number one, everybody seems to love technology. And second, it's more difficult to sort of uh, have it as a target of an aggressive campaign a la Trump. So, yes, this is creating sort of a, a challenge to uh, a political challenge to the free market system. So, therefore, Professor, how should one see the rise of Donald Trump? And what do you feel are the immediate economic implications if he were to indeed become the you know the president of the united states i know it's it's very very premature but i think clearly this is also one of the risks that many analysts are also taking into account when they're sort of making a forecast for the global economy so in that sense the risks that donald trump poses to the global economy if he were to become the president of the united states so it's very hard to assess because we don't really know what trump is about and uh, he has been extremely skillful in uh, tapping uh, on a demand that was completely ignored by uh, the other Republican candidates. And these are the white middle class uh, workers who feel disenfranchised. And uh, the Republican Party was able to carry them along by insisting on uh, sort of religious themes. Uh, but uh, this election seems that they don't care about the religious th themes. They care about their economic situation. Now, will Trump really become an advocate of the interest of, uh, of these guys trying to change things? Or has he used them just to propel it, it himself to the national uh, um, stage, and then he will do something else? It's very hard to tell at this point. I think that uh, the second hypothesis is more likely. Uh, but as I said, it's very hard to tell. All right, Professor, let's just shift gears and talk a little bit about about Prime Minister Narendra Modi, and I'm very curious to know, you know, what you make out of, you know, make of him, uh, you know, from a distance, because clearly when he became the Prime Minister, it was seen as perhaps the Thatcher or the Reagan moment for India, where, you know, where he would sort of, uh, sort of make free markets the running theme of the government and pull back government from a lot of areas. Two years down the line, how do you assess and what is really the perception of Narendra Modi in the United States, for instance? So I think that, uh, uh, unfortunately, there is not so much discussion in the United States about India. And I think that's a big mistake, because India does represent uh, a, a rising economic power and a natural ally of the United States in the, in the world scene. I think that the uh, latest visit by Modi uh, was uh, quite important in this direction. And I think Modi did receive a lot of recognition, uh, both speaking in front of Congress and, and uh, co-writing in the editorial uh, with President Obama. So I think that the awareness of the average American vis-a-vis -vis India is increasing, and overall, the perception of President Modi is, is good. So in that sense, you think he's lived up to the expectations of many, you know, many quintessential free marketeers like yourself? Uh, I don't know enough to say whether sort of he lived up in every dimension to those expectations. Uh, it's always difficult for a government to live up to all the expectations. I think that at least the direction India is going seems to be positive, uh, both in terms of, uh, of growth uh, and in terms of uh, changes and uh, liberalization and also a cleaning up of, of, the, of the banking sector. Let's talk a bit about Raghuram Rajan, your friend, colleague, somebody with whom you've, you've co-authored papers and, of course, a very famous book. Clearly, Raghuram Rajan's uh, possible second tenure as the governor of Reserve Bank of India has created and has been hotly debated within the country. Uh, I know your opinion might be biased, something that you've also alluded to, uh, you, know, you know, to the press earlier. But give us, you know, how, how is the world looking at Raghuram Rajan, the central banker from India? So I think that uh, the world, but not only the world, I think also India, looks uh, at him uh, as uh, uh, the person that uh, arrived to that position thanks to his merit and not his uh, connection or 
political collection and uh, also sees as a person that is trying very hard to uh, improve the allocation of credit in India. Uh, Raghu is, is a financial economist who has studied for many years uh, what uh, are the long-term consequences of having an inefficient banking sector that does not bring the financial resources to the right place, um, and even worse, what are the consequences of a, a banking sector that uh, trades favors for large capitalists or large industrialists who are treated very differently than the average common man. And I think that as a governor of the central bank, he has a chance uh, to change this. And, and my impression from the outside, from what I read, is that uh, he's actually doing uh, uh, important steps in that direction. And I think that a lot of the um, animosity against him uh, it strikes me as the typical uh, animosity that is uh, um, instigated by people who used to have a lot of political power. They are losing out, and they are trying to uh, attack him on uh, on things that uh, don't seem to be very sort of founded. I have not read any attack that seems uh, even remotely uh, credible. So in that sense, you're saying that the fact that he is cracking down on this, you know, on the non-performing asset crisis, bad loans crisis, and, and something that, you know, you've also talked about in, in some of your papers is the need to have a, uh, and create a pro-market culture vis-a-vis -a, -vis a pro business culture. You think that is what Raghuram Rajan has done successfully because of which some of the vested interest groups are now hitting back at him and don't want him to be around. Absolutely. I think that... Uh... Uh, the fight against vested interests is not an easy fight, and I really admire Raghu because I've only written about it, but he seems to actually conduct this fight in a very difficult situation, and I hope that uh, he has the support to win it. Uh, do you think it will be a gross mistake on the part of the government of India if they were to decide not to give another, another, term, to the, another term to Raghuram Rajan? Oh, absolutely, for two reasons. First of all, you cannot possibly find in the world a better person to run that bank than Raghu Rajan. And second, would be a signal that they are going to cave in to uh, the vested interest. And that would be a dramatic uh, uh, negative signal for India. Since this crisis arose, Professor, have you had a chance to speak with Raghu Ram Rajan yourself? Uh, no, I did not. All right, Professor, pleasure to have you on the big picture and taking us through a whole lot of issues. Really, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so very much.